The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. The day is Wednesday. It is April 27th, 2022, and welcome to the Benjamin Dixon Morning Show. As always, we begin our mornings with Black History. Dr. Carl Mack is out this week as he is preparing Black Heritage Days 5 and 6. Uh, we will continue the rest of the show with the rest of the team coming in. Rebecca Azor, DJ Exclusive, Georgia Fourth, the entire family. We're happy to be here streaming with you this morning. Let's begin. Hey, Google, what happened today in Black History? On April 27, 1927, Coretta Scott was born in Marion, Alabama. Blessed with a beautiful voice, she had her choice of the Juilliard School in New York, or the New England Conservatory of Boston. In Boston, she met a young pastor, affectionately called, M.L. Romance blossomed, and, M.L., and, C.S., became Mr. and Mrs. Martin Luther King Jr. Coretta led the efforts to make MLK Day a national holiday. Upon her death, Coretta Scott King was the first black person to lie in state at the Georgia State Capitol. Adapted from Black Heritage Day calendar by author, lecturer and civil rights activist Dr. Carl Mack. And again, you can get a copy of Black Heritage Days 4, from which we read every morning uh, behind every king. There is a queen, uh, Coretta Scott King, in fact, um, remembering her on this day, the day that she was born. I want to begin this episode and remind everyone that our phone lines are open. We want to engage with the audience a lot more. 301-715-8592. The ID, user ID name number is pinned to the chat room across Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, wherever you're streaming. Good morning to you, wherever you're streaming. Say hello to someone in the chat. I think we need to take a second to talk about what's happening in this country. Country. We've taken an extensive amount of time to cover Ukraine and Russia, a lot of other issues, but I think we need to lay focus right on what's happening in Washington, D.C. January 6th never ended. I want to make sure that we're clear that there is an ongoing coup in this country. And it is not just a coup against Joe Biden and this particular administration. It is, in fact, a coup against the Constitution itself. We are at the stage of decline in the United States where one of the major parties, the Republican Party, sees the Constitution itself as an impediment to their power, to their political power. And so as we begin to discuss the need to chase these traitors out of the temples, quite honestly, that is the language that we need to carry going forward. We must chase these traitors out of our temples because they have no intention of doing anything other than overturning our rights. And in the backdrop of this, for some, what the Republican Party has done and continues to do is not enough. I want to turn our attention to um, Mar not only Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is represents the faction of the Republican Party that has decided to go all in. There is a civil war happening in the Republican Party. The majority of the Republicans seem to be fully in lockstep with Donald Trump. Uh, the Republican Party itself put out a statement saying that what happened on January 6th fell within the acceptable parameters of political speech and debate. I want to pause there before we play any media and help you to understand that we're dealing with a political party that has put out a statement saying that the attempted overthrow of our government on January 6th falls within the realm of acceptable speech. And it's to that end that we have to be mindful of, of characters like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Kevin McCarthy, quite frankly, the House Minority Leader, who knew full well that Donald Trump was responsible for January 6th and needed to be held accountable for it. But that is not the language that we're getting out of these leaders at this time. No, Kevin McCarthy has gone on a rampage denying and, and essentially covering for Donald Trump. But when the rubber met the road, as these new audio tapes have been leaked and have been shared, rather, we see now that the Republican Party leadership knew exactly who was responsible for January 6th and the stakes. I want us to take a listen into some of these uh, audio clips now from Kevin McCarthy saying as much uh, back in January. Let's take a listen in. 
Details of Republican leader Kevin McCarthy's conversations in the days after January 6th were reported by Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns of the New York Times in their upcoming book, This Will Not Pass. McCarthy, according to the book, was so upset with Trump's behavior, he told fellow Republicans, quote, I've had it with this guy. McCarthy flatly denied the reporting, tweeting, quote, the New York Times reporting on me is totally false and wrong. And the Republican leader's spokesperson told the Times, quote, McCarthy never said he'd call Trump to say he should resign. But overnight, the Times reporters released audio showing McCarthy did exactly that. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to call him. This, according to the Times reporters, was during a phone call with House Republicans hosted by Liz Cheney just days after the attack on the Capitol. Are you hearing that he might resign? Is there any reason to think that might happen? I've had a few discussions. My gut tells me no. Um, I'm seriously thinking of having that conversation with him tonight. I haven't talked to him in a couple days. Um, from what I know of him, I mean, you guys all know him too. Do you think he'd ever back away? But McCarthy goes on to say he believed Trump would be impeached and possibly even removed from office by the Senate. The only discussion I would have with him is that I think this will pass and it would be my recommendation we should be done. Um, I mean, that would be my take, but I don't think he would take it, but I don't know. But weeks later, McCarthy's criticism of Trump had evaporated. He visited the former president at Mar-a-Lago just three weeks after January 6th. That last part is so critical. It only took a few weeks for this to transition for Kevin McCarthy from an impeachable and, res uh, and an offense that would require his resignation all the way to covering for Donald Trump. And I want us to make sure that we see this progression after January 6th, there was no correction, of course. There was no steps backwards. There was no walking back. In fact, they doubled down. The Republican Party said that what happened on January 6th falls within the realm of acceptable political behavior. This is the difficulty of what we're facing. I want to play this next clip. Uh, this is from Ari Melbourne on MSNBC. This shows us not just uh, Kevin McCarthy, but also Mark Meadows. Uh, he's covering 2,000 text messages that were provided by Mark Meadows and testimony others gave to the January 6th committee. Let's take a listen into MSNBC's Ari Melbourne. It's a new evidence here from Congress in the probe of the insurrection. Two thousand newly leaked text messages. And it starts all in the Trump White House with the top remaining aide, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. Now, CNN first obtained these texts that revealed how many Trump allies were plotting in and around, but perhaps most culpable from a criminal perspective, before January 6th. The texts come from Trump family members, Republican lawmakers, Fox News hosts, as well as some outlandish individuals pushing conspiracy theories. There are bombshells. Now, in the text messages to the White House, we also see communications between Trump's family, like Trump Jr., and the top staffer there trying to stop the mob from ransacking the Capitol. Donald Trump Jr. says, quote, this is one you go to the mattresses on. They will try to blank his entire legacy on this if it gets worse. Trump's own son, in the moment, secretly talking to a staff member because apparently Donald Trump Jr. didn't understand how much his father would like, relish, appreciate, and cheer on that spectacle at the Capitol. Then there's heat on Sean Hannity because on Election Day, Hannity texts Meadows, NC going to be OK. Meadows says stress every vote matters, get out and vote. And Hannity responds like any independent journalist would. I'm being sarcastic. Quote, yes, sir. As for the states that need the most attention, Hannity digs himself deeper on it. Quote, any place in particular, we, the supposedly independent media at Fox News, we need a push. The we is he doesn't even pretend to be talking or interviewing a source. He's just saying, let's work together to help Trump. And Meadows responds with more orders. Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada. Hannity says, got it everywhere. We can't tell because text tone is notoriously hard to read whether the everywhere itself was a little bit 
of a sarcastic jab because if you need help everywhere, you might be losing the election. The text also revealed Republicans urgently telling Meadows to get Trump to stop the violence. And again, this is something we've talked about in reporting on this horrific insurrection. As more of the Republican Party has warmed to this over time, we have the evidence, that's what's so unusual in this digital era, about how many even Republican lawmakers were concerned in the moment, not only for their own safety, but because they never apparently imagined this this would be cheered on by so many people on the right. Trump was silent for hours. All of this coming with the new filing from a court filing where the debate is over how Trump White House officials received warnings before the insurrection that they were on notice about possible violence. One White House aide says Meadows received a briefing the day before January 5th from a Secret Service official. We had intel reports saying there could potentially be violence on the 6th. As for the fraudulent electors plan, same testimony, says Trump was warned. The committee said to this staffer, to be clear, did you hear the White House counsel's office say this plan to have alternate electors meet and cast votes for Trump in states that he had lost was not legally sound? And the witness says, yes. Despite that advice, the plan moved forward. Now, the filing that we're using here for some of this reporting also says Republican lawmakers were involved. Meadows talked to many different conservatives, including Scott Perry, Jim Jordan, MTG, as earlier mentioned, and Lauren Boebert, about how to steal, potentially, or overthrow the race. Meadows handed over some of the evidence to the committee before infamously halting his cooperation, which is why the DOJ is deciding whether or not there's a case for indictment. Now, all of these pieces add up to what's happening in real time. You have the Republican Party that has co-signed everything that happened on January 6th, stating that it is a part of the acceptable range of political debate. You have Republican leaders, Kevin McCarthy. You have Republican media infrastructures like Fox News, all working together with the president of, at the time, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, attempting to overthrow the government because they did not like the election results. This is a major problem. I want to move to Marjorie Taylor Greene and add one more detail to this. Marjorie Taylor Greene took the stand to testify against a group of Georgia voters attempting to stop the far right Republican congresswoman from running for reelection under the 14th Amendment. The group says that Greene should be disqualified under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution because she supported insurrectionists who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. The 14th Amendment was passed by Congress in 1866, a year after the end of the Civil War, and ratified in 1868. It says, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or any other state or any state, rather, who, having previously taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. There is no question that this is exactly what took place on January 6th. And there's no question that actors like Marjorie Taylor Greene help facilitate it. The only question that remains is whether or not there's going to be any accountability. I want us to take a listen to this clip as an analyst tells us what it would take to remove someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene using the 14th Amendment. That said, an awful lot still has to happen before she's actually disqualified. The judge who heard the case on Friday first has to find that she engaged in insurrection or rebellion. That's a very high bar. If he makes that finding, it goes over to the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. We'll see whether he agrees. If he agrees, then Representative Green gets to appeal it to the Georgia State Courts, the Trial Court, the Appeals Court, the Georgia Supreme Court. And at the same time, Marjorie Taylor Greene can appeal this in the federal appellate courts and argue that the states don't have the right to disqualify her from running for federal office. So as bad as her testimony was, there still are many, many things that have to go against her to actually see her disqualified. The challengers have to prove that she engaged in or gave comfort to insurrection and rebellion. And just saying outrageous things, saying inflammatory things, that may well not be enough to constitute insurrection or rebellion. That's the question that's going to be before the various judges that I just laid out. And that's the question at hand. Will there be any accountability? Is there a bar? Is there a bar that can be met by the white supremacists in this country that would trigger some accountability? This is really where we are. And I, I, I think the emphasis has to be here for amendment. 
I, and I know we like to give a diversity of topics and we don't, I don't particularly like to stay in American politics. I'd like to keep a focus on international issues, but it's very difficult to keep an eye on international issues when domestically we are being threatened from within. There is no existential threat outside of the United States. The threat is from within, and it resides with people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Donald Trump, negative 45, and all of his cabal who are more interested in maintaining power than facilitating a peaceful transfer of power. This is all about Donald Trump's ego and the people who want power. And so they are attaching themselves to Donald Trump. And that means that they're willing to get on the stand like Marjorie Taylor Greene. They mentioned her testimony. Here's Marjorie Taylor Greene. And she makes it very clear that not only is she a part of this, but she's a Neanderthal. Listen to her testimony as she tries to make her way through this. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene confronted by her own words about the January 6th insurrection. The Georgia Republican took the stand for a hearing that could end up disqualifying her from running again. In a three-hour testimony under oath, Green faced questions about her rhetoric and actions before the attack on the Capitol. Uh, Ms. Green, if somebody tried to unlawfully interfere with the process of counting the electoral votes, unlawfully, that person would be an enemy of the Constitution. Wouldn't you agree? Interrupting Congress, like when the Democrats interrupted Congress and had a sit-in on the House floor and stopped Congress. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene went to the top of the White House, Chief of Staff Meadows, and said, quote, in our private chat with only members, several are saying the only way to save our republic is for Trump to call for martial law. I wanted you to tell him. Taylor Greene also called on Meadows to have Trump declare martial law during the insurrection on the 6th. Here she was just three days ago, though, under oath. Prior to the inauguration uh, in 2021, uh, did you advocate for martial law um, with the president of the United States, I don't President recall. Trump? I don't recall. In those meetings, you discussed with him your advocacy for the idea that there should be martial law declared in the United States. No, I don't recall ever discussing that. Well, are you saying it didn't happen, or are you saying you don't recall one way or the other? I don't recall ever discussing that. When did you first uh, become aware that there were going to be large demonstrations in D.C. on the 6th? I don't recall. And who put it on your calendar? I don't know. Somebody on your staff, I take it? I have no idea. I don't know. I do not recall that, no. I don't recall. I don't remember. I don't think so. I don't recall the exact days. I don't think so. I don't recall that at all. I don't know. I don't recall. That was the video, but I don't recall. Prior to January 6th, Representative Green, did anyone ever mention to you the possibility that there might be violence in Washington on January 6th, 2021? I don't remember. Okay. So it's possible that folks told you things could get violent in Washington on January 6th, right? I was a brand new member of Congress. If I, I don't remember those conversations, but I would hope Nancy Pelosi and those in charge of the Capitol were taking the uh, Capitol security very seriously. You believed that Joe Biden had lost the election to Mr. Trump, right? Well, yes, we saw a tremendous amount of voter fraud. We have uh, investigations going on right now in the state of Georgia. There's investigations going on in multiple states. Do you believe the FBI uh, was behind the January 6th violence at the Capitol? I don't know. I certainly think there's a lot to be investigated. The second page of the document. The question now is whether or not we're going to allow these Neanderthals to bring down this democracy simply by saying, I do not recall. There is a lane, quite honestly, for them to accomplish this because this justice system has been set up to provide cover for people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Let's make no, no mistake. This system is set up to erect the worst of the worst amongst us. They elected Donald Trump to the White House. So this is a perfect world for someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene to be able to get on the stand and to country bumpkin her way through destroying this democracy. But she's not alone. She is not alone. The entirety of the Republican cabal that supports Donald Trump. There are some 30 percent of U.S. citizens who are ready to go with Donald Trump all the way to him overthrowing this government. So we have to pause and ask ourselves the question when the Republican Party has control over the judiciary, thanks to Donald Trump, 
appointing some 83 justices and judges across the, the federal judiciary with re the Republican Party in position to come back into power in 2022 to take back the Senate or to take the Congress. And more importantly, when the Republican Party has houses across the entirety of this country in every state, state houses, state Senate chambers, and the governor's offices, they are in a position to strike a fatal blow to our democracy. And to be quite honest with you, that is their goal. The phone lines are open. I want to hear what you think about this. Uh, the number is going to be on your screen. It's going to be in the chat rooms, wherever you are. We're going to continue and expand this conversation going forward because I want us to keep a laser-like focus on what is happening in real time around us. I think we have become desensitized to it, to be quite honest with you. I think we have gotten to a point where we are so comfortable with our politics being so absurd, so dysfunctional, simultaneously so absurd, so dysfunctional that we cannot preserve the lives of a million Americans during this pandemic. No, we, instead of doing what we could to reduce the number of deaths, this country did everything it could, particularly half of this country who refused to put on a mask. This is the absurdity of the moment, but it is not just that. We are dealing with people that th this is not enough. It's not enough that during the pandemic, the wealthiest in this country facilitated the biggest wealth transfer we have ever seen on the face of this planet. The rich got extremely richer during the pandemic while the essential workers were left to die. Literally, that wasn't enough. They have to go even further because that pesky thing called democracy continues to stand in their way. For someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, democracy is an impediment. For someone like Donald Trump, democracy, which put him out of office, is an impediment. And to so many of the Republicans, they are finding that the Constitution itself is an impediment to their political and economic goals. And so what do they do? They throw it out the window. They have no problem whatsoever overthrowing this entire country for the sake of their ego, their ambition, and their political and economic power. They will overthrow this country for their political power. And if the Democratic Party doesn't get this, if those people who are running for office this time around do not get this, then I fear 2022 might be the very last domino. I think 2022 coming up is going to be the last domino, especially if we do not have a fierce opposition to this Republican party machine that is ready to take over this. In fact, they have every position in place. They've even got they've even got Twitter now. We've been talking about Elon Musk purchasing Twitter. We're going to cover that a little bit more in the own o'clock later on in this in this episode. But I do want you to chime in on that. When we consider the number of people who are celebrating, specifically the people who are celebrating, the Trumps of the world who are celebrating, the Heritage Foundation, a Republican organization, they are celebrating uh, Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter. When we look down the line, this is something that the fascists and the Republicans in this country are celebrating. Why? Because they know full well that Twitter is one of the la was rather one of the last places where actual free speech could foment to the top of the algorithm. Well, now that algorithm is owned by Elon Musk and the data and all of your data is owned by Elon Musk personally. It is no longer a public company. I want to take this caller. Caller, you are live on the air. What is your name, comment and or question? Hello? Uh, You're on the air. Uh, What's your name? Hi, this is Tyler again. Um, Good morning, Tyler. What's on your mind? Uh, my friend? So, uh, first of all, uh, on the January 6th stuff, I, I know you were on Elon Musk. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't truly really feel like anyone's ever going to be held accountable, or at least, at least the ringleaders and, the, and those that started it, um, or initiated the attack on our democracy. I think, I, I think there's still going to be like, prosecutions of the people that uh that are that that took part in it but but ultimately those 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 who orchestrated the attack are, not, are i don't think are ever really are, are, are ever really going to be uh held accountable because I, when you're rich and powerful uh yeah it's 
I, I think it's I think it's obvious, but yeah, just, no, no, it, absolutely, it, it's just not going to happen. Yep. Tyler, that's the fear. That's the concern. And that's what we absolutely have to watch out for. If the powerful are not held accountable in this country, I mean, and this is really what we're dealing with. January 6th is whether or not we can hold our political leaders accountable for absolutely anything. Can they get away with overthrowing the government? Uh, Donald Trump said that he could get away with shooting somebody on Fifth Avenue. Well, it looks like he could get away with overthrowing the government as well. We have to take it to a quick break. When we come back, we'll be on the clock. It's in the hands of DJ Exclusive More of the Benjamin Dixon morning show right after this break. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Shout out to all of you, man. You know the voice, you know the sound. It's your boy James Lumber Williams, DJ Exclusive. Is in La Building, La Playa, La Place, you know? All right, y'all. Good morning, everybody. Make sure that you stay tuned. We got more coming up next year on the Benjamin Dixon Morning Show. On the clock with Jordan Ford. He's coming up next. Good morning. Good morning, Mama and Daddy. Love y'all. Mean it. Shout out to everybody in the chat room. Silver City Socialist A.R. Walker. Ben Cycle Dragon. What's going on? Mary C. Kitty Muse. Iris Jones. Good morning. Melanie Dennis, what's going on? Boondocks Dragon, Good Crap, good morning. I see everybody this morning, y'all. Good morning, y'all. Tyler Hackner, good morning. Thank you for calling in as well, too. Jay Dragon, good morning. Snack Panther, I know you're in there somewhere. Good morning, brother. Brother Latini, what's going on? Good morning, Malia. Hope you're not giving daddy a hard time this morning, but if you are, that's okay. Give him a hard time. It's all right. <laughs> Happy Hump Day, everybody. Good morning. Oh, me. Good morning, Stephanie Rampley. Infinite content. What's going on? Ezra, good morning to Shelby H. Emily French, good morning. Class, good morning. Shout out Elon Musk who bought Twitter for $43 billion. All I did was just download it for free from the App Store. I don't know what the hell he was trying to do. Is him on Nashes. Good morning, Elizabeth Mazza. Good morning. What's Bush Productions? What's going on? Hey, Miss Sophia. Good morning. Silk City Socialist. I'm not old, but wise. That's right. I'm really, really wise. What you've been mixing, serve it up the way you please. I love the way you shake, you stir, you hear, you squeeze. So thick. Push up and butter me. Good morning to you. It's okay. It's karaoke. Anything that people sing never matches what the vibe is. So you can sing it. John, good morning to you. <laughs> All right, y'all. I know y'all have been enjoying the dad jokes and the music. But right now, we are on the clock. Let's get it. Let's go. Good morning.
Welcome back to the Benjamin Dixon Morning Show. We are on the clock. Coming up in this segment, we'll be speaking with Stephanie Bald Spalding, forgive me, Dr. Stephanie Rose Spalding on her run for Congress. Uh, she'll be joining us at 845. Good morning to everyone across all the platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. You could join the conversation this morning by calling in. The number will be across your screen, 301-715-8592. Good morning to you, DJ Exclusive. Uh, we appreciate what you're doing over there, man. How's it going with you? Pretty good, sir. How about you? It's going, man. It's going. You, uh, uh, I was in and out of the dad jokes. Y'all were having a good party this morning with us already, without me. But that's okay. I will. Uh, I'll catch up on the next break. <laughs> right. We having a. Um. I. I heard what I wanted to ask about actually was you figured out a way to get karaoke going. Yeah. Yeah. How? I mean, it's not difficult, like and 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 okay. it's 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 pretty simple. Um, basically, I can share the screen, and there's a website that people can go to called Watch Together, and that website syncs everything: music, oh wow, microphone, everything. I did a little small test yesterday, but I'm going to widen the test later today, maybe tomorrow, okay. so then right. we can make sure that it's working correctly. But it's real easy to do. People will be able to get in queue. I can type in what song they want looking for. They want to sing. Nice. They can unmute nice. their mics, and yeah, the hardest thing and is going to be go getting people it. to unmute their mic. But that that won't be a problem. Yeah, <laughs> actually, no, that is a problem in this pandemic. It's still 2020. Everyone is still uh, on mute in Zoom. So, but no, it sounds uh -huh. like a great idea, man. I'm going to be there. Uh, we encourage all the people who cannot sing. We want you to come, especially because that does actually make it a lot more fun. Um, I mm -hmm. uh, Georgia, Ford, Georgia Ford is not with us uh, the last couple of days. She has been out on location covering stories so many important issues and we have quite a bit of her footage i want us to take a minute to go over some of the things that georgia has been doing while she's been away from the morning show uh this first clip is of resma menekem and i know without a doubt that i did that name wrong please forgive me um and this is a clip of uh what is being described as one of the most profound powerful and perceptive voices uh of our time he is considered to be a healer an author and a trauma therapist and georgia is interviewing him here about his new book the quaking of america and it is a defining cultural shifting piece of literature that surveys america's deteriorating democracy and offers embodied practices to help us protect ourselves and our country. I think it's an important conversation. Let's take a listen to this interview with Georgia Ford. In The Quaking of America, you talk about the GOP inciting a civil war by in, inciting a collective trauma response. Talk about that. Right. I'm going to just say, uh, so, so when I talk about the GOP inciting a war, and inciting specifically a racialized war, having very racialized pieces to it. Um, I think about it about when I was watching the January 6th uh, coup, attempted coup, right? I'm sitting there watching that, and there's a part of me that knows this is getting ready to be crazy. Right, I'm, wa I'm watching what people starting to show up. White people starting to show a lot of white. Like when a whole lot of white people start showing up to an event, I, as in my black body, I'm like, this could go bad really quickly. Right, specifically around democracy, around votes, around um, around legislature, right? I'm sitting there watching that. And then I start to see the gallows being erected, right? I'm like, wow, that's, so, so we're reaching back and now we got a hangman's noose. Now I'm starting to see the Auschwitz signs. Now I'm starting to see AR-15s. Now I'm starting to, and now I'm starting to see weapons. Now I'm starting to see people kick out windows. Ain't nobody dead yet? Ain't nobody shot nobody yet? Why are they allowing this to happen? So as I'm watching this, there's both this kind of, I'm, I'm simultaneous holding this, this thing like, this is, this is curious and disbelief that, that th all of these white bodies are beginning to do things and harken back to particular points in our culture and in our history, right? The noose. The, 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 the Auschwitz, all these particular pieces, right? And nothing's happening. Nobody's mm. moving in to stop it. Everybody, mm. right? 
everybody's mm. leaning towards giving white people a lot of comfort. Hmm. Doc, I, I got to see the rest of that interview, uh, James, because yeah. I, I'm glad somebody else sees it. Like, I, I sometimes, matter of fact, Brother Back last week said, you know, Brother Ben, I sometimes thought you were going crazy over there with your right wing conspiracy. And I'm like, no, man, I, you know, he, he, he sees it now. Right. And, and listening to that interview, um, it's important that we have people in positions that understand very clearly the stakes, because as he said at the very end there, James, there's a lot that's coming from this white supremacist strain and white in, in America, but nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's stopping. In fact, they're going further. They're, they're getting more emboldened. They're getting louder and prouder with their racism and their dangerous rhetoric. What do you think? man? Mm. Oh yeah, that's absolutely right, Ben. Uh, you see that. All the day with the appropriation of our culture and mm. our uh, white, white counterparts. I, I, was, <laughs> white. I was waiting. I was waiting. White. Waiting on white. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And in the after party today, we probably have a video that shows. Oh the my! Appropriation of our oh culture. man! Listen! Oh my listen. gosh! This is that's I a, saw it. That segue is off the train. I, man, I, I saw. That was a. You know what? <laughs> I saw that video and I know what video you're talking about. What she was rapping, was she rapping the baby or little baby? I can't remember little which baby. baby she was rapping. Yeah. Little baby it was one of the babies she was rapping. Uh, we'll play that in the after party. In the meantime, I want to shift gears a little bit here. Our guest is uh, <laughs> our guest is here already, Dr. Stephanie Rose Spalding, who is running for Congress. She's running for Congress in Illinois' first district. I had the pleasure of speaking with her first on the Nomiki Show. Good morning to you, Dr. Spalding. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? We are wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us this early in the morning. Tell us about yourself and your I, run. In I'm sorry, Illinois. but I actually cannot hear Benjamin. <laughs> okay, not a problem. I'll keep talking until you can hear me a little bit clearly. Um, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about your race, your candidacy and your campaign there in Illinois. Fantastic. Yes, I am running for Illinois' first congressional district. For those who do not know, it is the uh, district that Bobby Rush has been the congressperson for the last 30 years. It is also the district that Barack Obama lost to Bobby Rush when he was first trying to enter into federal um, government. And it is one of the first um, major minority majority districts in the country. So I am running to bring back the investment and love and hope to the district that I grew up in, where I was born and raised and where my family is still very integral in, in this district. Mm. I had a chance to speak with you on the Nomiki show and you were talking about um, the economics uh, of your of your campaign, the economic policies that you're fighting for working class people fighting for infrastructure. Tell us about some of the things you're fighting to bring to that district. Absolutely. Like we are in such a disparate space, right? There are some parts of the district where, you know, because the people don't necessarily look like us, um, where investment has really thrived. Um, but then there are other spaces like right up the block from me where there used to be really strong economic corridors on the South side of Chicago that have not been, um, revitalized in decades. There are just tremendous food deserts. There is a vacuum of jobs in this, specifically in this district, throughout certain zip codes where Inglewood, Auburn Gresham, Roseland, West Pullman, those places where you have had uh, white flight and banks to leave. And so for me, it is how do we make sure that opportunities and resources are equitable, especially from the federal government? We talk about infrastructure. Transportation is one of the worst in, in this part of the city as well as the state. And so, again, for me, uh, when we think about what is just, what is right, especially for black communities and minoritized communities, it is returning that investment to our neighborhoods and to our communities so that we have equal opportunity across the board. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm, I love it. I love it. Uh, you, you're you're representing or you would be representing the south side of Chicago. You mentioned Bobby Rush, uh, former Black Panther activist, just uh, all around civil rights uh, icon. Talk to us about that intersection of economics as well as the racial fight, because what you described there on the south side of Chicago in the first district, it sounds a lot like Jacksonville, Florida. It sounds a lot like certain parts of Atlanta, uh, James. <laughs> right. There's, there's a, there are food deserts. There's lack of opportunity. And, and obviously, we know wherever there's lack of economic opportunity, we see increased crime rates. Tell us about that intersection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So first, we contextually and historically, this is the space where you had black people who were fleeing the racism of the South. This was where they they were drawn to in the Great Migration. And even prior, um, it, there's even a stop on the um, Underground Railroad here in this specific part of the district. And so there's this connection historically to the institutionalized racism that is built in, caked into American society. And so there are also in more recent times histories where there are high schools in this district where, you know, people that I know, my, my grandparents could not attend. They could not be caught in parts of this district at certain times. But then again, you had the great migration, you had um, integration happening. And what ended up happening was a lot of white flight once black and brown people started to move in in the late yeah. 60s and the late 70s. When you watch A Raisin in the Sun, they're really talking about what is happening and going on in the housing market of Chicago on, on um, various parts of the city, but it's happening right here on the South Side. And we have the remnants of that institutionalized racism that has kept economic prosperity and wealth building where black people thought buying a home would be their gateway into building wealth for their families. Now you have families that are losing value in their property because there are no banks, there are no businesses, there is no economic value around, surrounding the community. And so yeah. crime rates are increasing and all of that matters, which is why the, the work that I do at the federal level really speaks to truth and conciliation work. We saw Harvard taking accountability yesterday, but it's not enough. This entire country needs to take accountability for the impacts of institutionalized racism on our communities and the effects that we are still living with. All right. I, you know, James, I, you know, we, I don't know how we do it on this show. I might, I might have to just thank the, the producer or the algorithm because we end up finding the, the dopest black women coming through <laughs> snatching. I mean, cause, cause Dr. Spalding, like you said a word there. Right. And and I think what's so frustrating for a lot of black people, particularly, is that we've sent a lot of people to Washington, D.C. who look like us, but we ain't mm. got nary a thing in return. Mm. Right. So, like, can you how do you convince us and the people listening? Because you said uh, you're saying everything right. Um, but how would you convince someone who is disillusioned because of how many black faces we have in high places, but they ain't doing nothing for us? I would say, listen deeply, right? That people's track records should demonstrate the kind of fruit that they will produce. That's the scripture, right? I'm also a pastor, right? That a tree is known by its fruit. I have been working in truth and conciliation practices for years doing, I, I literally am a critical race theorist. So all of this conversation that people are now coming to, I've been uh, doing for decades. And I, mm. I not only know the research when people are asking, well, we need to do a study. We don't need to do a study. We need to actually do the work that repairs the harm of institutionalized racism and policies that are built in white supremacist ideology. Like we know folks track records. So listen to them deeply. Look at the fruit that they have produced in their past. And that's who we should send into these spaces that have access to power. If they've done nothing previously, they're not going to do anything differently going mm. forward. Mm. Mm. Dr. Stephanie Rose, Spalding, tell everyone how they can support your Ooh. campaign. 
You can support our campaign in a multitude of ways, three specifically. First, find us online at spaldingforcongress.com. You can volunteer virtually. You can volunteer in person. You can also donate to our campaign because the other piece is Black women are the least funded when they are mm, running for office mm. at every single level. So if you're watching right now, even if it's a $5 donation, we need your support so that we can get in these seats. Wow. Dr. Spalding, yes, thank you so much. Like I, I, I honestly probably would ask three or four more questions, but I know you have a hectic schedule. But I will say this, James. <laughs> hey, man, let's take a road trip. Let's go up and volunteer in the first congressional district uh, and, and hey. help with somebody. Let's get up there and knock on some doors uh, because, Dr. Spalding, I absolutely love what you're saying. Absolutely. And I've never been to Chicago either. So this would I would love to go and I would I do got my best you. to get there. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. We'll love to have you back soon. Thank you. I want to shift gears here uh, and go back to some of the reporting here uh, from uh, another dynamic black woman. James, we blessed with, I mean, we, we surrounded by some pretty dope black women. Like, uh, man, yes, we are, Ben. Yes, we are. I just, the I just black women. Pause. The black women rock, man. I love it. Black woman magic. Yeah. Not black girl magic. Black woman magic. I love it. Grown. That black grown. I like the auntie magic, man. I'm I like, <laughs> it's the aunties. Bring out the aunties for me. But the black woman, grown woman magic that can change your life. Um, I, I, it's highly recommended. I digress. I want to move on to another dynamic black woman. This is another clip from our sister, Georgia Fort. Uh, yesterday, uh, she wasn't with us because she was attending the first black owned bank opening up in Minnesota. Uh, first Independence Bank opens in the Twin Cities. This is the first black owned bank in Minnesota open its doors yesterday morning. And uh, it is a Detroit based company that has been around for 52 years and received support from five corporate owned banks. Um, let's take a look at this grand opening opening that Georgia Fort was a part of yesterday. And being a first owned, first black owned bank reminds us of banks being beacons of hope. What you've seen with the collaboration with the five banks, Bank of America, Bremer Bank, Huntington Bank, Wells Fargo, and U.S. Bank, is that when we work together, we can do things that can be unprecedented, like today's historic announcement. So we're very grateful for being here today representing a black bank, the first in Minnesota. Black-owned, but we're not black only. We're hopeful that we can grow relationships with anyone. And that's important because, you know, I've been personally asked by folks that don't look like me, well, can I bank with you since you're a black-owned bank? Well, absolutely. Because it gives us the resource and the capacity to really be effective in the spaces that we're trying to go. So as Lieutenant Governor, uh, I have the honor to welcome you officially uh, to Minnesota. I'm incredibly excited that we can say in both Michigan and Minnesota, we have this incredible institution. We're about to really rewrite the history books, not just with the historic move of a black owned bank coming to the state of Minnesota to service the Twin Cities metro area, but the how it came together, right? How you got five large institutions that parked their logos at the door and they came together and supported the whole initiative of partnering and bringing a black owned bank here. What an exciting day. We are so delighted to be welcoming First Independence Bank to our community. This is just wonderful. I was part of a group from US Bank that worked together with Wells Fargo, Huntington, Bremer, and Bank of America, all of us collaborating to provide the resources required to help First Independence come to this community because we are all so passionately committed to creating an environment in this community where everybody can thrive and where we address the racial wealth gaps that existed for too long in this community. Well, First Independence Bank has been around now for, we're approaching 52 years, serving the underbank, the unbanked, and specifically people of color. We're a resource with solutions and we're hopeful to partner with underbanked and unbanked communities to serve and give them access, creating home ownership, which will lead to generational wealth. Oh, man. Um, shout out to Georgia people, Ford for that wonderful. The chat room uh, is going crazy over that guy. The last guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> he was so excited. 
I've never been excited like, about sure. anything the way that man. I don't think I've been excited about anything the way that white man was excited about his bank right there. But I, I'm sorry. It was amazing. Listen, listen. Don't charge it. Take down Georgia Fourth today. <laughs> Because we're sitting in the background, like, okay, so shout out to First Independence Bank. Like, that is a great, the, the black-owned yes, bank that's awesome. uh, mm -hmm. is definitely needed, especially when you look specifically how black people have been um, intentionally um, alienated and targeted, redlined, out of wealth. Uh, and there's nothing that we can do in this system. You know, the entire time that clip was playing, my, the socialist in me was just twitching, just like, ugh. you know, <laughs> it was. But there's literally nothing that we can accomplish here without the proper funding, without the right manpower and boots on the ground. So shout right. out to the bank. And I, I'm trusting that as they carry that label of black owned, that they will address specifically those things that black people have faced historically with all of those banks that are now partnering with them, including Wells Fargo and Bank of America. So, you know, all of my <laughs> all of my socialism uh, senses were tingling and, and and but still at the end of the day um if we do not have the resources to get accomplished what we need to accomplish then we're going to continue to see black communities uh dilapidated uh with all of the talent in the world with all the but no resources so shout out to georgia right. for going there and getting this coverage yesterday Absolutely. what were they saying in the chat I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, sure, dude. <laughs> I, was just, I was like, oh. but, right. But you know, it is <laughs> awesome. I know we do so have a, um, a, a black bank here, and I cannot remember the name of it. And it used to get frowned upon so much. But over the past mm. few years, it, it's grown so much, actually, yeah. that it's become one of the top banks here in Georgia. So it, yeah. I, I, I think it's real good. I, I know it's going to go far. I mean, I hate that you heard that. Those other names, those other bank names. <laughs> like I was like, said. oh, not, but, not, not <laughs> Wells like, Fargo. Ugh. Not Wells Fargo <laughs> that opened up millions of fraudulent accounts, but you know what? And let their their let them do something good. And not for a only change. that, let them do something good. But also good for a change. giving black people a hard time. That's right. right. Ex ex That's exactly, right. Dwayne. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know what? We'll feel a lot better. Put a couple of more zeros behind their funding, and and we'll forgive you, Wells Fargo. Drop them. Right. Open up a whole new line, like like a, a billion dollars of line for them, and then we'll forgive you for all the other stuff. And then mm -hmm. for those overdraft fees that you put everyone through, Bank of America, the class action lawsuit where millions of people had to sue because. Bank of America was rearranging those purchases. Remember that back in the day? Bank of America would take your biggest purchase and put it first so that every time you went to Starbucks, McDonald's, everything that was like $2 ended up costing you $40. Bank of America mm -hmm. did that for years. Uh, so I think also you need to pour more money into the black community just to make a, a, a penance for all that you've exploited from the black community. <laughs> oh, Lord, y'all get me out of this segment before we go even further. James, this is a good spot as any. I think we're at the top of the hour. We got a lot of more clips a lot of black more black woman magic i like the way you change that it ain't black girl magic it's grown up <laughs> magic coming back on the benjamin dixon morning show after this break we'll be back cheers to all the haters because you proved to me yeah. that rising to the top was my <laughs> destiny yeah. you can see whatever from behind me but i'm still fly i'm still fly i know I'm big peace good morning I'm to still you fly. let's go Breaking good morning from the inside out. It's time to say it with your chest now. Say it with your chest now. I'm free. Ain't nobody. So I bought a dog off a blacksmith yesterday. And as soon as I got home, it made a bolt for the door. Man, I don't know. I don't get it. Hey, I flow it today. I swear it is. It's my time to run it out. It's my time. It's my time. It's my time to run it out. It's your time. It's your time. Oh. If you're on the bus, say yeah. Yeah. If you're on the train, say yeah. Yeah. If you got a walk, say yeah. Yeah. Everybody's going somewhere. Yeah. Young or old, I really don't care. Craigan, did you say more? Okay, cool. What do you call a zombie who writes music? A decomposer. I'm young. I'm free. Can't nobody take me here and now. It's my time to run it out. 
Mara Sharice, good morning. It's my time to rise. It's true. Good morning to you, it's true. I'm free. Can't nobody take me here. And now it's my time to rise. Unfortunately, my obese period just died. But it's a huge weight off my shoulders. Stay tuned, like it or not, it's coming up next, y'all. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. <laughs> Sticks and stones. Brenda Johnson, good morning. <laughs> but your words can't hurt me. Alicia, you're going to throw a tomatoes me. at me. I love you, too. <laughs> That's right, y'all. Y'all blame Craig for that. He wanted more, and I gave him more. No, it just can't hurt me. No. No, you just can't hurt me. No, no, no. I know it's hard to be polite, and it's easy being petty. My mama used to tell me, gotta use you when you ready. Man, it's crazy how my brother said it could have been my son. It's either prison or a grave, that's when everybody tell me. Man, life ain't a beach, it's a female dog. I'm staying ten toes down, though I still might fall. Oh, yeah, now I didn't came through, and I can get this off you. I was loving people who persecute you. It's still a tough life. I put my path and the lamp under my feet. I know my faith strong, but my flesh still kind of weak. When that victory be looking like the verge of defeat, and I feel like this respect. Tell me, turn my other cheek. Why did the musician's wife fall for a divorce? They break my bone, but your words can't hurt me. No, you just can't hurt she me. She was sick no, of the domestic violence. Right. More than I've been wrong, and it still can't hurt me. No, it just can't hurt me. No. That is terrible. <laughs> Angela Aiden, good morning to you. Tell her I, I can do that, I think. <laughs> My dad said, son, stay out of, uh, stay out of strip clubs or you might see something you shouldn't. And he was right. I went in and I saw him. Got no diamonds on me, but I stay shining. Yeah, yeah. They say the world would be a better place if we take out the hate. Stop all the hate right now. Uh, let's keep Carmen, it, I know Carmen, you're killing me too. Yeah. So be a light up on my path and a lamp under my feet. I know my face uh, strong. Okay, but last one. Okay, I promise. I, promise. Okay. I once like got, got free cake from a haunted like freak's bakery. That place gave me the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> Just can't hurt me. No, Shut on the team for the super right. chat. Big shots to Mr. Matt Strike Mine, Ben, aka Letter Hack. So you love, Lion. So you love. No, you just can't hurt me. No, you just can't hurt me. No, no, no. Like it or not, with Benjamin Dixon starts now. I forgot the best. Oh, uh, well, I missed it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. And he literally said the mics were open and I went on a diatribe. Welcome to Like It or Not, where we're free to tell the truth. <laughs> I care who doesn't like it. <laughs> It is Wednesday, August, uh, not August, what the month is this? April 27th, 2022. Damn. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I'm trying to skip ahead a couple of months. Uh, anyway, James, how's it going with you this morning? I know we're waiting on the queen to get here, but we are at her disposal when she arrives. The, the queen arrives. is always late. It's just like, by the time she gets here, it's going to be the end of the show. But, you know, I digress. <laughs> and then she'll be ready to go over stories that we already went and over. We can already cover <laughs> Oh, uh, man, you know, anybody, any, you know, any person, I understand my wife now, because anyone who spends more than like two hours with me, I, I realize every single morning you guys spend about two hours with me and you see how, James, how I go from this serious, it's the end of the world all the way to like, we will literally laugh about anything. It doesn't matter how juvenile, <laughs> it doesn't matter how gutter bucket, like it's the full range of emotions that you get with me any given morning. <laughs> Ben um, will go yeah. from UFOs in the sky in Area 51 to, uh, <laughs> uh he ain't got no goddamn yeah. sense. <laughs> to 
talking about voting rights. <laughs> right? We're talking and, about back Will Smith again. slapping Chris Rock or Chris Rock oh sla- You know what I'm talking about. See? <laughs> or the baby, you know? Or the baby. Gunning down people in, in Walmart. <laughs> and making the style, you're getting the pinky toe shot off. God damn. It shot me in my pinky toe. Um, shot me in my pinky toe. But you know what? You know what? All jokes aside, no, I will set that joke aside because I don't want to make light of what happened to Megan Thee Stallion. Uh, yeah. Even though you set that up perfectly for Harlem Nights, uh, I don't want to make light because, uh, one, Megan is a human being. And then, two, Megan is the a humble human rapper being in the right now. Right. right. And right. she's just so she's done so her. much good and everything, especially graduating right. from Texas Southern University. So, yeah, you know, hey. that's a, that's a real queen. She's done rapping, doing everything that she's done, graduated college. Books. So y'all can't say nothing bad. about I've never me. I've never actually felt bad about my height in my life, James, ever. I, I, I never really cared that I was five, seven. Until I realized Megan was 5'10 without the stilettos on. So I'm like, man, what, what, what? I wish I was a little bit taller. Uh, but shout out to her. Let's get to some news before I get canceled this morning. Um, it's always a race to see who's going to get canceled first on this show. Uh, how edgy will we actually allow ourselves or will we try to play by the rules? Let's actually go. Um, <laughs> David, I'm going to hold that story. For a little bit later, because that's not the kind of <laughs> place I want to land that sentence. I want to talk about Harvard. Uh, Dr. Spaulding on the last segment mentioned that mm. Harvard was actually going to take some accountability. And I'd say that uh, with quotations around it um, for their ties to slavery. Harvard is committing one hundred million to address its ties to slavery. The announcement follows an extensive report that articulates how Harvard was patronized by men who were made wealthy through slavery. According to the Creation Committee's report, the Legacy of Slavery Fund is a, quote, necessary predicate to and a foundation for redress. The fund stops short. (laughs) This is the part. The fund starts short of calling for monetary reparations to the descendants of those who lived life as an enslaved person. This is a quote. uh, The fund will perpetuate research create more opportunities for people of color and seek to memorialize those who were enslaved and honor their memories by creating connections to their descendants, said Dr. Steven Beckett, Harvard historian via the New York Times. So uh, they're going to study. They're going to commemorate, but they're not going to run them their money, James. Uh, what are your thoughts? Who determines how much is enough? Mm. <laughs> You know, who determines that? Like a hundred million? Did y'all just come up with that? Well, let's give them a hundred million. That'll, that'll make them happy. You know, mm. uh, I, I, I think it probably should be a little bit more than that. Hmm. Just, just give us the university. We cool. Make it HBCU. <laughs> Harvard HBCU. How you? Think Harvard about HBCU. <laughs> yeah. I like that idea. Matter of fact, since you're not going to give reparations. Which I don't understand, because if you're going to commit $100 million, do you know what $100 million would do for the descendants of slavery, for that group, for that descendants of enslaved people, rather? Actually, I like to say more precisely, the descendants of survivors of slavery, because our ancestors were survivors of that shit. But I digress. Mm. That money specifically targeting the descendants of the white men who got rich at Harvard off of their slaves. Like we're not talking about all of African Americans of all the descendants. We're not, no, we're talking about those specific people who are tied to Harvard. They have receipts. Uh, James, let's just, before I even finish that thought, I want to make sure this is not a mystery. We know exactly the men they're talking about. Look at the founding fathers. How many of them went to Harvard or connected to Harvard and owned slaves. So we know exactly the men And we know the slaves that they owned and finding their descendants would not be difficult. A hundred million for that small group of people would change their lives and change the course. But instead of giving the money to the people, they're going to have services and commemorations. Okay, cool. Nice. Mm. Then the least you can do is make sure every black person goes for free. Go ahead. What are they researching? What what research? How bad they were? What research? Yeah. What research? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> we already know everything. What are we researching? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody. So what that translates into is that some probably white historian is going to get uh, funding to research slavery at Harvard. I mean, yeah, I know people are like, oh, you guys, you can't satisfy these guys. You can't give them nothing. Um, 
You can't just give us anything and accept the, expect us to be excited about it. That's the difference. You're right. Um, here's a here's a story that I definitely want to get Rebecca to chime in on, and we'll we'll circle back when she gets here. There's a new study, a new survey that finds employees would rather seek different employment than go back to the office during the midst of this pandemic. Al Jazeera is reporting a new survey from payroll services company ADP, finding employees everywhere are demanding more security and flexibility. This has been intensified by COVID-19 and tight labor markets. Employees are holding fast to their demands as employers are trying to bring them back to the office. Surveying nearly 33,000 people worldwide, ADP found almost two-thirds of them would look for a new job if they felt forced to return to the standards on a variety of fronts, or rather, return to the office. Uh, the pandemic has sparked a rethink of priorities. This is good. This is the best part about this, man. A rethink of priorities, and workers are signaling a willingness to walk away if employers don't meet their standards on a variety of fronts. Shout out to workers everywhere who are refusing to put up with this crap from their employers yeah and it's real because here it is you were telling us that our jobs we can't do our jobs from home but here it is during the pandemic we whole ass set up our home life and bought work life into it so it Mm. it can be done after y'all telling us that it can't be done it can be done and now because they're throwing out this narrative that everything is back open and it's safe you want me Mm. back in the office and Mm. I will I will my ass will quit in a heartbeat if you make me try to come back in office. As many people that are out here hiring people and and doing everything, I can find another job with no problem. But you're not mm. going to force me to come back in a place where I could potentially still get sick. The pandemic right. is still here people. It's not it's a whole ass pandemic. Okay, so I, I'm not rushing to get back into the office. My boss and I had that conversation. When are we going to see you? Uh, <laughs> probably not <laughs> going to see me. Special occasions. Uh, you know what? I give you special occasions. If we have a client visit, I'll show face February. one day. February. <laughs> February 32nd. <laughs> You'll see me then. Okay. It's a method of control. Going into the office is a method of control. I have, in fact, we all do know working from home is far more efficient. I don't know mm-hmm. if anyone's done a, a, a statistical study of it, but anyone who's done it knows that you spend far less time wasting time at the water cooler, talking with your neighbors or your neighbors talking to you. I never forget. Rebecca better hurry up and get here because Rebecca used to be in the office singing all the time, James. I'm trying to prepare my stories for the day. And she's back there like Pamela James from, from Martin. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Really? So you don't have to, you don't have to you know deal with stuff like that when you work from home. You get more done. Ooh. You know what it is, Ben? I, I, this is what it is. You remember? I don't know if you saw that image. The guy posted that picture of this is my office for the next eight hours, and he's in the tub with the laptop sitting across the thing. I uh-huh. think that's what what's prompted all these people to think, oh, y'all need to come back in office. It don't matter what the hell I'm doing. I could be sitting here butt-ass naked. As long as I'm working and answering the phone right. and doing what I need to do, I'm making right. you money. It's how, the way, how I'm making you money should not matter. If I'm right. sitting here and I'm long as I'm working, that's all you care about. You see me logged in. You see emails going back and forth. It don't matter if I'm in a tub, if I'm outside, if I'm wherever the hell I am. As long as you right. make your money is getting made, that's all that matters. Don't try to comfort me because you can't do the same thing. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. They actually can. Man, listen, mm-hmm. I, I've worked I've worked every kind of job, man. I've been a teacher. I, I've thrown trash. You know, I've cut grass. Uh, and I've worked with a tech company. I went public with a tech company. It was a fun ride. Can I tell you, they their starting place is work from home. And their starting mm-hmm. place is actually, it's, it's take as many vacation days as you want. So long as you get your work done. Nobody yep. checked over our shoulders. Nobody made us punch a clock. I mean, everything was literally, as long as I got my task done, I was able to go on vacation as much as I wanted to. And it just shows you that there's two different class of workers here, man. Like, we're all workers. We're all laborers. But there's those who have the ability and the flexibility to live their life as they see fit, and they're treated accordingly. The rest of right. us, because I've worked in both worlds, the rest of us are forced and herded into these warehouses where they exert control over us and we have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. 
Mm. Like we getting so anyway, school, people school. said they're not going back to that <laughs> yet, no more. They they done with that. They are not going back to y'all warehouses. Um a couple other stories here that I want to go over before we take a break. I want to go back to uh, Georgia Ford's coverage in Minnesota. There was a Minneapolis protest in honor, or rather standing with Palestine. Uh, Minneapolis shows solidarity with Palestinians in an emergency protest amidst Israeli raids on the Alask Mosque and attacks towards Palestinian worshipers during the holy month of Ramadan. Now, we haven't been doing much coverage of this, but this, is, uh, this was a flashpoint in Minnesota. Minnesota, Minneapolis specifically, and Georgia Fort got coverage. Let's take a look at it. Before attacking the worshippers in Aqsa, Israel killed 17 Palestinians just during Ramadan. 17 Palestinians were killed by Israel. At one point, they killed six Palestinians within a span of 48 hours. So we're out here um, protesting against uh, Israeli aggression, against um, Al Aqsa Mosque, which was desecrated and continues to be desecrated by Israeli forces during the holy month of Ramadan. <laughs> Gaza, Gaza, don't you cry! Gaza, Gaza, don't you cry! Palestine will never die! Palestine will never die! I don't think Palestinians should have extra rights. I'm not asking for those. I just want them to be treated like human beings. So imagine a mosque being invaded and attacked by hundreds of armed thugs. Now imagine that happening to a church. Imagine that happening to the Vatican. Imagine that happening at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And what would your reaction be? We just want that same reaction. One of the things that we saw with Ukraine is that people can care about issues that are not in the U.S. They can care about issues that are overseas um, that don't directly impact them. And so we're saying, hey, if you can care about the Ukraine, then you can care about Palestine. And especially, again, considering the fact that, that the U.S. plays a pivotal role in Israeli occupation um, with the funding of $3.8 billion annually. No more violence, no more crime. No more violence, no more crime. Israel out of Palestine. Israel out of Palestine. Israel is in a losing battle. Well, why? I'm not just saying this. I'm not bluffing. All right? We have Palestinians resisting against one of the most powerful armies in the world with rocks, and they were able to drive out Israeli soldiers from an Aqsa. Israel is in a losing battle in the public image, and so they are desperate, and they're doing everything that they can to stifle Palestinian resilience. Mm. Shout out to Georgia Ford for being there and getting that footage and that coverage uh, there in Minneapolis of uh, an emergency protest standing in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Uh, James, I don't know if you remember that episode that we covered. Uh, it was about a year ago and we we're speaking with um, the sister there from Palestine. And forgive me, her name escapes me, but um, a bomb went off in the middle of that interview. Oh, um, right, man. That was, um, if I'm not mistaken, and David, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that was tied to the attacks on the same mosque uh, over a year ago. Same uh, mosque. So the same yep. mosque. Yes. Okay. Wow. Um, so we'll be keeping. And so, it, so you know, I'll, I'll, and, go ahead. Al Aqsa Mosque is is it, it's it's like a a focal point. It, it's one of their um, most significant places of worship, and because it's, I believe, I I don't know the map by heart, but I believe it's in the center or right in the in in the heart of Jerusalem. And so, this is not a coincidence that they're doing this on Ramadan mm. on during Holy Holiday. Um, mm. And I love I, I, I when that brother in the video said, I'm not asking for extra rights or special treatment. He said, can you imagine this happening at a church? No, I can't. To be quite honest with you, I simply cannot. Can you imagine this happening at the Vatican? No way in the world this happens mm -hmm. at the Vatican. But had it happened at any of these places, what would be our reaction? And I think the just thing is to have the similar reaction to this in that same way. So shout out to Georgia for getting that coverage and sharing it with us. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris rather, um, tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, on April 26th, the vice president's office announced that Harris had tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, according to her press secretary, Harris will isolate and continue to work from the vice president's residence. Um, vice, uh, the press secretary, Kirsten Allen, said due to their respective recent travel schedule,
schedules. Harris hasn't been in close contact with the president or the first lady. CNBC is reporting that the vice president is the highest ranking Biden administration official to have contracted COVID. Uh, the president, despite coming into contact with those who later tested positive, has not yet caught COVID. Both the president and vice president um, are vaccinated and boosted. So uh, we are still in a pandemic, man. Still in the pandemic. Shifting gears really quickly to one I'm more sorry. story. Hold on. Before you get there, it was a pregnant Wait. pause for a reason, Benjamin. Oh, oh, no. I, because oh boy. how Kamala got oh COVID, she don't ever go nowhere. But, you know, I oh, <laughs> on to the next story. <laughs> you in the house. I ain't never, you know what? Never mind. I love, I love you, Kamala. But how? How, sis? VP, I don't, okay, let's go. I didn't say it, but I'll stand by my man who did. <laughs> I got your back. I got your six. Um, <laughs> Joe Manchin. <laughs> this oh clip God. right here, I really wanted Rebecca to be in, but we'll bring it back when she gets here. Uh, Joe Manchin says he's concerned about voting rights in this country. That, mm, Okay, I'm not going to go on on a soliloquy of describing him. Let's just play this clip mm. of Joe Manchin saying the country has a lot to work, a lot of work to do to ensure voting rights access and says that he is particularly concerned about it. Let's take a listen to him. Uh, sir, on voting rights, I've always believed that healthy democracy depends on a voting system that is accessible, free, fair, and secure. While history is going to tell us that we've come a long way in ensuring all individuals, regardless of their race, sex, or political affiliation, have the ability to cast their vote, we can all agree that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the recent opinions and rulings that seem to undercut decades of established legal precedent under the Voting Rights Act. You know, what's particularly disgusting about this clip is that Joe Manchin is the individual, the key star of the filibuster standing in the way of voting rights being protected, specifically protected. So it is the situation where the villain, the the blood drenched villain in the movie is standing in the temple saying, I'm so sorry, we have to make sure that we protect everyone from the violence that that villain created. Well, mm -hmm. in this story, Joe Manchin is the villain. He is the one, along with his bestie, Kirsten Cinema. They are the ones who are standing in the way of voting rights being protected. And yet he has the nerve, the unmitigated gall, the caucasity to stand there and say that it's the top <laughs> of his concern, me. James. Uh, <sighs> uh, a Republican in Democrats clothing. Mm. Yep. <laughs> Might have a couple of sheets in his clothing basket. Anyway, I digress. Uh, mm. Moving on. Mm. <laughs> Benjamin said it. I didn't, but I stick beside my man. <laughs> I'll go. That's a hill. I'll I'll die on that one, James. You take okay. the cobbler hill. I'll take the Joe Manchin hill, okay. man. All day. I know somewhere in that man's family lineage is a clan robe or two. The way he's carrying on, you can't tell me that Grand somebody Master. in his family ain't been at a lynching and then go to Sunday school. Come on. Joe Manchin worried about Grand voting rights, my ass. <laughs> His family members in that scene in Django Unchained. You know what scene I'm talking about? They out on the hill the first time they put the mask on. Oh yeah, that oh, was yeah. people's one of them. He's one of them. He's just looking down the hill. <sighs> Speaking of other uh, ones of them, because you said he's a Republican in Democrats' clothing. Let's talk about his colleague, uh, Representative Cawthorn, Madison Cawthorn, who yesterday was dressed um, in a. You said the negligee just wasn't fitting right, correct? That that was a problem. It wasn't that he was wearing a negligee; it's that he just wasn't wearing it right. <laughs> Well, now he's going he's going thug life now. And Madison Cawthorn got caught with a gun at the airport um, from North Carolina. He was cited for having a gun at the Charlotte Douglas International Airport. This is the second time Cawthorn has been discovered with a gun at an airport and he could face fines up to thirteen thousand dollars. It was loaded. Wait, wait, hold on. Hmm. He had the gun at the airport trying loaded. to board the plane mm -hmm. loaded. And all uh -huh. he can face is fines up to thirteen thousand dollars. You, you said it right, Dwayne. Yeah. Uh huh. So now anybody else would have been put on that no fly list. So no fly <laughs> list would have been sitting under the jail. Right. right. Second time. Yep. Man. Sh exactly. Second time mm -hmm. offense. And um, so I, I don't know if he's trying to juxtapose the negligee life with thug life. Doesn't matter. All I'm saying Blake. is, how do you get away with this twice? Twice, twice, and only and only thirteen thousand dollars. 
Mm. The math ain't. I math. honestly think he's trying to run for office off of this type of stuff. I think that it's yeah. a calculation, calculated move and decision. And the privilege that he, assuming that he's not going to get arrested, that's that. That's just another. It's got to be. That's a whole other level. Got to be political privilege on that, because I, I don't, I don't oh, think it's yeah. white privilege, because I don't think this. You, you get random Jim Bob, Jimmy Crack Corn, from <laughs> Bethesda, Georgia, come up with a loaded gun. His ass is going to jail. Uh-huh. He'll, he'll, he'll make it to jail alive. I'd be dead. You'd be dead. All black folks be dead. But everybody else is going to be arrested. Remember the guy in the Georgia at the Atlanta airport who mistakenly had a gun and that gun mistakenly fell out <laughs> and went off. Um, they tracked that man down and that man is going to serve some time, obviously, because that's the system See? that we have. It's, it's set up that way, but not for politicians, apparently. Yes, we have a visitor. Mm. Well, that said, we have uh, now coming to the stage. <laughs> Why you said say it like that, Ben? Is good. Put your hands hell, together. Hold on, hold on. No, before, no. Before put we, your hands together and show your love. Before, I was about to do the we, Steve Harvey before thing. Before we do that, uh, there was a clip to go with that uh, Cawthorn story. Let's let's. Oh, that. let's write that clip real quick. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. Three sources tell our team that U.S. Representative Madison Cawthorn was cited for having a gun at Charlotte Douglas Airport this morning. Now, according to the TSA, a 9mm handgun was discovered at Checkpoint D. The TSA declined to identify the person, but they say, sources Decent say, three of them, that it was Cawthorn. It's unclear if he'll face any criminal charges for this. A spokesperson for CMPD would not immediately comment. This is not the first time that a gun has been discovered on Cawthorn at an airport, though. We know in February of 2021, TSA found a handgun on Cawthorn's carry-on bag at Asheville Regional Airport. Cawthorn did not face any criminal charges for that Jesus incident. Christ. Nobody. No charges. I mean, no charges. The rest them, of us. Them hoops is big. They about to weigh your head down, girl. Do you hear me? I love it, though. <laughs> the queen has returned. No, not as big as my head is. It's a very bad situation. Um, Rebecca, like, your head is not that big, Rebecca. Your head. <laughs> I, now, I will say, I, I, I think I say this all the time on the show. Like, I have a lot of hair, so... It, you know, it gives a lot. When I was bald, because I had shaved my head off before in my life, and wow. I realized I ain't got no head in the bag. Ain't no head in the bag. <laughs> All this time I thought I did, but honey, I ain't got no got head right in the bag. Nothing. He's, Nothing. He's just like the flat head. Yeah. Late on your that's where I stopped for me. <laughs> right, Dwayne. I think that's what it was. Nah, that's was what popping it in the back of the head. Because. <laughs> My head is actually, if I cut my beard off, y'all, my face is really round. Like, my head is, like, really round like a globe. And it takes me to cut my beard off for everybody to see it. That's why I don't say this thing down there. So, y'all will well, never ra- see round, that. Well, round, I love a good round face. You see? I mean, I love my face. I have, like, a um, a long <laughs> face, long head. Right. So when I do, like, my ponytails and stuff, it's just really long. Like, you know, like the Kelly Rollins of the world. Like, those mm. It's just a yeah. long face, right? But... I think, you know, everybody has a nice shape. Ben has like a, uh, he's Glober. a round head too. <laughs> Glober. I'm a Glober. I'm yeah. <laughs> he's a Glober. Oh, the head? Oh, I'm talking about the face. Now Ben's head. <laughs> oh, the, no, I'm, I'm, what, what, what's the official name of the alien, uh, of the, Wap, of the, 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 Wap the, no, 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 the, no, the, the scary aliens from the movie, the, uh, uh, Not uh, the hood or whatever. That's the kind of head I got. Yeah. <laughs> you you got I, the alien. Turn to the side, man. Turn to, look. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, man. No, Ben got a hit on him. Um, yeah, we all got. Hey, look now. Look here, Bambi. Now wait a minute. I wasn't going. I wasn't going to tell you. I yeah, wasn't going. That's what I was thinking of. They called me Bambi in co- in college. So they called me Bambi in college because you know we all went. We, I think we talked about this on the show. We all went. Xenomorph. Thank you, animals. Tigers. Xenomorph. Yeah. yeah. I'm. I'm definitely. Um, I'm in the Eeyore. The any any horse like uh, animal. That's what uh, I. Like. I used to call her Inspector Gadget. <laughs> like at, uh, Meg the we Stallion. Were... <laughs> oh yeah. I hate when they do that to her. Every yeah. time she laughs, they um they make they the, 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 the horse noise. But my my Meg. friends did that to me in middle school. If I would start talking, they'd be like, Hee-hee-hee. they would do that to me. <laughs> no. It's not that funny, Blaine. Uh, that's. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was, and then I was really tall and skinny. And then, like, you know, when you, I was just, I had no body, but I used to look like I was walking forward. Oh, so it would always look like I was galloping. <laughs> <Rebecca. Thank you. laughs> what Mike Epps say? Bevo Lottie. Got more head. Oh. You got body. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's what I was. That's what that's what it was for me back then. And oh, so, merciful Jesus! Uh, and you learn to just grow into all of those features, and then you know, everybody be on you. <laughs> so I got exactly. no problems in my right. lifetime. But oh man, but, I, I love um, Rebecca come in and just literally. It don't even matter what we talking about. It just she just takes it and takes it to twelve. Rebecca. <laughs> I love it. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. But I hope that you guys have been having a great Wednesday. Um, and we've been holding it down Cawthorn. for you. Cawthorn. Who's Cawthorn. that? Cawthorn is the guy we just talked covered him yesterday. He was the one with the um who had the picture of him in the in the negligee, which was, you know, fine, whatever. It's just like James said, it was improperly fitted. It just was a bad fit. It wasn't oh, good. I haven't what seen I, I don't know who game. I haven't heard this story. <laughs> He's I've a been... Republican uh congressperson yeah. from South Carolina or is it North Carolina, David? Uh, yeah. North um, Carolina. This was him on Monday. Right, no problem. I mean, cool. Like he's he's having the time of his life. Well, it's not actually Monday. It was it was like before. Right. Well, Congress, you know, but figuratively it came out over speaking. The <laughs> figuratively speaking, this was him on Monday, and then this go to what's next on Tuesday. On the next day, uh, he was coming out. Thug life uh, got caught with a gun at the, uh, North Carolina, uh, Charlotte oh. airport. But all he's going to face is uh, fines up to thirteen thousand dollars. No criminal charges as of yet. He was at the. Um, he probably was at the. He's at the Capitol. On January, 6th. <laughs> he is definitely he a nine January times 6th. out of ten. He's a, is he a January sixter? <laughs> he is a sixth. He, yes, he was. He goes along with Marjorie Taylor Greene and yeah, yeah. That's the whole best. crazy Q, Q, Q and I. crew. Okay, whatever. so he. Um, I just want to know his importance because he looks familiar. He almost looks like one of the people also who was, you know, uh, trying to not have um, Katanji Brown. You know, um, no, he, he didn't like those people, but because they got a look, they got a look. They do they, have they, a look. Features on those people. Yeah, January like sixth, that same day. You know, they they were sitting in front of Katanji trying to call her all kinds of disrespect when names had her. Mm-hmm. Look, oh, they got a look. Okay. Anyway, very much Doug uh, funny. Yeah, right. Well, I like Doug mm-hmm. funny, but mm-hmm. they they right. got a look. <laughs> They got to look. Anyways, um, I just said that to say, I don't know that man, but just looking at him, and I hate to say we could judge a book by his cover, but anything y'all tell me about that man, I'm going to believe it. You're going to believe it. I'm going to believe it. Um, I, I, I was going to believe it. I was going to try to go down a couple lists of things that we could say about him, but I don't think we can make up anything that's worse than what he really is. So, um we we'll, 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 uh, so, I mean, it, it, if, if he's a cross dresser, that's not a problem. Like you said, <laughs> Bubba, the, it just wasn't given. Uh, his it outfit wasn't. just wasn't given. I don't know if he was doing that to be. James, you know, I've got to research people. it. I, you know, I'm going to have to research it now because you dropped it a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> You're being just don't just, just look long. up the definition. Don't look up pictures. Just look up definition. Of, of, okay. okay, just definition. Okay. All right. Definition of what? So he's, he's, he's dropping Easter eggs <laughs> in the show. <laughs> Is that a? I think is her, that a? Her, I don't know. Yeah, I term. think her. Yeah, I think it's not for. Uh, I think it's for. It's not group. for the straights. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, his cross. Oh, there you go. Cross I, didn't wanna, I didn't know how to say it. There you if go. he's a cross dresser, that's not the issue. But I know that people that um, you know, majority of the people that are. Um, Tiger. That are our conservative thinkers or, you know, our January Sixers. Uh, they are not about anything LGBTQIA+. No, plus. So yeah. I, I'm not sure if at that all. It's like that for um, mockery or for whatever mm, the case. You know, some question. of them times they, they do that. They go out. They be doing, I don't know what the reason was, but um, to was, juxtapose that cruising. with the... I guess whatever he what he was caught with. Um he's probably pro guns, I'm pretty sure. He's pro you yep. know, he's prob all Absolutely. of that. So it all falls that, falls in line for that. Yep. So all that think, was was a high, uh was a campaign ad. That's yep, all that was. Yep. Y'all think they caught him with the gun in his stockings like he was one of them wild west floozies? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And That's the little garden belt thing in the way. You got to make sure you know. See, we say stuff like that. You got to put your cap, and, and it don't even matter. He's a bald black no, man, so they yeah, gonna think he's anyway. All you got to think is Kevin Samuel's mindset, and you got Dwayne right there. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Damn. Damn, Dwayne. High value man. That's that's what you got Damn. right there. That's what you got. Right there. 
<laughs> Wait, you might have to cut on your camera and defend yourself on that one, bro. Oh, no, because I believe that he probably likes some of Cam- Kevin Samuels. Um, Man, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't watched no Kevin Samuels clips in forever. And before, when I was watching them, right. I was watching them just for laughs. Same thing I do on Twitter. I go in there just for laughs. Yeah. You still watch them? Mm. Not no more. <laughs> but, but. Oh, no, I want to do these after that. party ones here. I, the, those two after party ones, I want to do them in the live show. Um, Which one? The one time. about the the one that I had? Well, the C-SPAN about? call it. No. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, the C-SPAN one we can yes. do. The other one we can't do publicly. Why? Because oh, of the of the music, yeah. right? Yeah. The, well, the we, what music? Okay. The one on you talking about the one that I dropped for CMT about CMT? No, that one we can we can, we have ready for you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. So we'll do all of them. Go ahead, Rebecca. It's in your hands, Captain. <sighs> well. Last night as I was up in the wee hours of the morning, because I couldn't sleep, mm-hmm. I got up because the spirit hit me in my shanana, and I got up to pray. And uh, <laughs> I got on Instagram after I prayed. That wasn't a good follow-up for me to do, but I couldn't sleep. With the Lord, but okay. So I got on to Instagram after I prayed, and I said, you know, because, you know, you be friends with the celebrities in your head. So Monica, I'm like, why is she posting at this time of night? You know, uh, what's going on? So she actually posted about um, her being called out by um, a they're, he's a he's actually a journalist or a reporter um, and his name is Patrick Howley and he I guess you know men with microphones <laughs> they got a podcast you know what I'm saying um, and so he <laughs> went to discuss and this was a few weeks earlier I mean, maybe like a week ago a week or two ago when the country music I believe country music what's the T stand for CMT is the TV. Yeah, yeah okay, CMT. So CMA it's anyway, it's, it was the Country Music Awards, though. CMT, Country yeah. Music Awards. So, um, and uh, what we have, let's take a look at what Patrick Howley said first, and then we'll get mm. to uh, Monica. This uh, award show was really kind of a train wreck. There was uh, a chick who was uh, co-hosting it, and they said that she tested positive for the Rona. So let's uh, take a, a look. Last night. I know all of you were I don't know who this black guy is who's hosting it. This is supposed to be country music. No offense. I mean, y'all have hip-hop and basketball. You know what I mean? It's like, just fly with your flock, bro. I'm not against you, but you're up here being like, the melanated people invented country music. At the CMT. We was making country music in Wakanda before Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard done stole the black man's country music. It's like, all right, bro. It's so angry. There were so many black people there, sorry to say, but like so many black celebrities who have nothing to do with country music. And it's like, why? No disrespect to uh, to the, the funky brothers of, of, of music. I love Earth, Wind, and Fire, <laughs> Run DMC, etc. But I mean, like country music's different. Country music's different. It's not Wakanda. Huh? It's not Wakanda. Um, so... Uh... <laughs> I, I it's really, it's not <laughs> country music. It's not it's, Wakanda. It's not Wakanda. But, but <laughs> that's funny. But Anthony Mackey is a well-known. I think he's. Well, he, is he going to be Captain America? I mean, America? he played he's, freaking Falcon in Marvel he, movies, and also is you. the new Captain America. What? The, thank you. Okay, continue, so, so sorry, to disrespect apologies. him, and you know, whites they love the Captain America and all that good Marvel stuff. They love that stuff, so they know exactly who he is. Talking about who is this, and then to say who is this black dude. Um, but that's not the issue here. The the performer was um, Monica. And so as I'll read what she wrote last night when I, my shine and I woke me up and I went to the gram after prayer, <laughs> she took to Instagram. She said, I've never been more motivated. Patrick Howley, although your feelings are likely shared by some, it's not the mass by the masses. I have an all-star legendary team of true country artists that are currently working with me mm. that would beg to differ because of the genuine hearts. Uh, and then she said, I shared the stage with uh, Jimmy Allen and little big town who we know are huge um, country music artists. Uh, Mm-hmm. This was the first of many times that you will see me. I see you caught the, the, that my skin is melanated, but you missed that it was tough. You know, <clears throat> Monica, I could hear her saying that for sure. She said, I'm right. rooted in, I'm rooted in the world, the word. I'm rooted in the word and mm. built to last. See you soon, or should I say welcome to Wakanda? Mm. Gracefully. <laughs> and then she says, bows with um, Anthony Mackie. Uh, and, and so if uh, Monica's actually working on a country music album and she's been promoting that, really? she will be doing country music. Um, and so she, a lot of uh, a lot of people, um, you know, who are have country music. Let me start here. Mm. The, historically, 
Historically, historically, country music don't belong to um, whites. Historically, country music is uh, 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 the start of it was from melanated people. Okay, Mm -hmm. out of Wakanda. So, um, you know, and for for a lot of country singers and artists, they people who are true to the country music, they'll even give um, their props to the people who came before them and how the country music was taken and remixed and, you know, to sound like it is. That's why when you hear country singers, there's a little twang in, in what their voice is. You don't hear that mm-hmm. with regular white folks, well, like with the country well, music well, singers. Well. Yeah, they got a little twang in there because it is something that was fashioned after, after black artists and black artistry. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of black country music singers who just don't get the shine. I've listened to them. I've actually, uh, you know, here where I live, uh, I've heard them being interviewed on the country music stations um, because it's real country (laughs) out here. But um, for this this man who is and he actually is a reporter for, you know, of course, like Fox News and all these other. um, Well, um, that explains a lot. Here's the thing. For him to be able to just be blatantly racist is not the shocker for me. It isn't. But. White folks just really, they come in and take stuff and then believe that it's all theirs. And then they'll say, um, eh, well, good example, Twitter. You know, um, Twitter's, uh, Twitter being where it is and what it is is due to black culture. If black folks didn't get bored and get on there and start having true conversations with each other and calling out uh, white supremacy, uh, arguing with each other about different things of our culture, uh, start posting pictures of our looks and um, having Mm -hmm. conversations surrounding that, um, you know, now creating a space called black Twitter, um, you know, it. Twitter wouldn't be where it's at, right? And I I can say that for sure. But then you have people like white folks who um, now want all the power and want all the credit. uh, And so now they do things like make their commentary on there and buy it out and things like that. And here we are where this white reporter came out of nowhere. Never seen this white reporter before. And he had the nerve to disrespect black presence at the country music Mm. awards. And um, I hope that people rip him a new one and then school him on country music um, and Mm. how it was hijacked, uh, colonized. um, And then this is in we were given what you see here. Then um, for him uh, to say country music is it's it's just different. It's not this. It's it's just different. (laughs) How? Because you think it's supposed to be only white people? No, my brother. Do you know how many black people are in country music these days and uh, in 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 topping these charts? You need to do your history, man, because it's a lot of black Mm. people doing country music. American Mm -hmm. Idol. It has at least three or four black people that are singing country music this season. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Okay. It's it's just like y'all need to get over it. Y'all know they can stand it. Somebody just just said it. Baby and Beyonce song was an artist. Yeah, it was really nice. It's a country song. It's an, a country R and B song too, honey. Because you know, country mm-hmm. music is really R and B. But anywho, it is. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, but I, I was listening to, and I'm like, this black country artist, I have never band. heard of. Never heard. Like he's charting, but you won't hear him in 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 groups like uh, 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 with people who are in country music. Nashville isn't going to be something that really blasts this artist um, for real. K. Michelle started off doing yoga in country music that's her that's where her background is yep. so at, at, in her album you'll hear her drop like three country songs often um and she always gives credits to the greats before her black ones and white ones um and so now uh i think this this understanding that um country mm-hmm. music is just just white is crazy to me especially if you hear how they're they're singing that doesn't come from regular uh, white style of singing that's not historically that is something that comes from black people and it y'all can't tell me that carrie underwood don't have some some black somewhere in there that comes with a a hinge of soul (laughs) yeah anyway i say i have to say i don't like when these men especially just men get the mic right and get these mics and start these little shows and stuff and just be loud and wrong girls is women is doing it too they're doing it too hey, but something about these Re- men Rebecca. grabbing the mic and just being loud and wrong hold on and then <laughs> and then the white ones the white right-sided <laughs> ones get on here and just be like black black er 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 black 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 er er joe rogan black 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 er 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 that's it that's all they do everything makes them mad <laughs> it's true 
You got the baby crying, Rebecca. <laughs> Sorry, beautiful baby. <laughs> I'm, not endorsing I'm like, it's not okay. all men, by the way, because I mean, goddamn, I think we do pretty good. We, I mean, yeah, the majority yeah, no, of it's us different, anyway. but it's different over here. It's different over here. Like we, I get on here, I say what I say. Now I'll drop the facts of the news, and then I'll, I'll have my my say about it. But honestly, I said this before majority of the podcasts that go viral are black men saying something against black women. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we see white people from the right who are grabbing the microphone. And anytime they say something that protects their whiteness or what they think is protecting their whiteness, and they're speaking against black people or supporting things that are clearly racist, prejudiced, Mm. um, you know, uh, they go viral. And then... Mm. We see podcasts like Joe Rogan. Spotify gives him millions of dollars just to stand down on him saying ER. Hard ER. Hard. Yeah. Yep. So, this is- yeah, it beat him boys. <laughs> boys. <laughs> Island boy. <laughs> it beats <down>. Island boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an oh, island man. boy. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> stop playing with me. Look, stop playing with country music, okay? Okay. Ask about it before you get on your mic. And Wakanda is a really beautiful place. A lot of people are trying to claim it. And Atlanta can't even claim Wakanda. It ain't Wakanda over here either. It's too Not it's no too much of a precious place. Uh, <laughs> you know, and with black powerful people who do real amazing things um and so you you couldn't imagine colonizing that place you just Mm, couldn't right you just couldn't so the country music awards could never be wakanda however um you know we can definitely buy it back buy it back buy it Mm. black we can definitely Mm. pull up that's why they got anthony mackie at the forefront they want to be inclusive all of a sudden because they understand that there will be a time that black folks will start creeping up and start Critical race theory. They don't want to be a part of that number. So they was like, let's put a black man on the mic right now so that we can get right, right in front of it before they start oh, pulling out geez. historical facts about white folks stealing songs, hey. country songs. Here, okay? here it is, Rebecca. Here it is. What they mad at is that they came over here trying to gentrify uh, hip hop music, R&B, and, and, and all our other shit. So now they get we mad when we up here them. gentrifying country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> shout out, shout and, out and to the boy. We shout can't out to the boy, Lil Nas X. Already ours. We can't yeah. gentrify something that was already ours. We allowed right. the, the artistry to be there. We said, okay, if you gonna sing, you gotta sing. Blue eyed, blonde hair, you gotta sing. We just want to hear it coming from your soul. Okay, that's all we wanna. That's all we wanna do. But. When they start imitating a little too much, it get on my nerves, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, if you they can say sing, imitation you can is sing. the highest form of flattery, but honestly, it's just annoying me. If you can All sing, you supremacists. can sing, honestly. I, I don't care if you're white, black, I don't care what you are. Mm. If you can sing. Not when they're not when they're politics, they on there singing the soul and preaching their hearts out black as they want to be, and they preaching white supremacy, and they, you know, that that's when I have a problem with it. But other than that, yeah. Give me give me an Adele some some singing so any day. Shoot. I have a problem with right. um well, Adele's from, you know, the UK. They got a different yeah, kind of yeah. voice over there, too. Um, they I thought you were going to say they got a different kind of racism over there. They do. No, they got a different kind of singing voice. I don't know. They can just, like, it's something that they, they can sing out there. Um, but, but it's something about the... um Say that. The, um, hmm, Iggy Azalea, you know, who's uh, from Australia... Uh, and people have a problem with her I doing. She from Australia. People have a problem with her <laughs> doing the <laughs> accent or the black accent. I never really had a problem with that because when I hear um, artists like, and I'm going to say Eminem, love and mean it. We don't hear him talking like the man that we just heard talking about um, the CMT at, at all. We, he right. just has it. He just who you're surrounded by. Now I know that Iggy Azalea is from Australia, but people had such a problem with her rapping in that in that voice. Yes. But then I heard the girl that does. I understood the assignment. I had I had that. I thought she was black. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's a white woman. White, 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 <laughs> completely white. And she is profiting <laughs> off of um, um, this black accent in black. I went to go see her as well. She wears wigs. You know, like bad wow. baby. Not bad baby. The, is her name bad? The little girl that you. That little she girl, can actually she wears rap though. Wigs, the, 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 <laughs> the, the, I, I, she wears the wig. She does the whole thing, and 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 she, it, she's benefiting from it, right? right. She's benefiting from that whole yeah, thing. Right. And they can monetize so, our blackness. We can't. We can't do it though. We can't use that. We can't. 
We out here, this is what we do. We wear the wigs. We don't wear the wigs. We have, like, full lips. We got, like, we have the accents. We have a, but for something Y'all about have the, even, uh, uh, they have the, the, the butts. Remember? The, Remember yeah, when the big asses. asses were, like, anathema? They're like, oh, my God, her butts are so big. Oh, yeah. my God. Now they have they the booties. In on they, now they have the booties. Uh, y- yeah, same thing same with the lips. Thing with the, the, the braids. The, the braids to the back. I said, K. Michelle made a song called, um... I wish I was a Kardashian so I could be black. She said, <laughs> put my face over Tupac, wear my braids to the back. Because I, didn't, that I is never acceptable. heard that one. <laughs> that yeah. is acceptable. And I, I love that song. And I hear Damn. it and I understand what she's saying. You know, hey, baby. Um, um, you know, I, I hear what she's saying. And to in this culture, no matter what we do, no matter where we are in it, this space that we're in, um, that man went viral for his commentary, right? Uh White folks can get a mic and say the same exact saying that things that we're saying. Uh, they don't even experience the same things that we're experiencing. That's why we make most of the 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 the, the news that we do something that is either somebody talking against us so that we can step right before it and speak for our people from our experiences. That's right. um, but when a group of people who are um, you know white are saying the same thing. It seems to be more grounded and more acceptable, more palatable for people to hear heartbeats. and to monetize. That's right. It's the five heartbeats. Nothing but remember they 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 took them off the cover and put those those dudes on the cover mm-hmm. so they could sell it mainstream. It's still mm-hmm. it's still the same phenomenon. And I'm quite yeah. honestly kind of tired of it, to be honest with you, because I do not want to see blackness wrapped in white faces. No, No. Hmm. I want blackness from where it comes from, right? From the original source. The thing is, is that the algorithm, the capital, the money, Mm -hmm. the structure, the infrastructure, the system, the policing, everything is structured to benefit whiteness in this country. So, yeah, no, uh, cash me outside. La La Mama can go and become a millionaire, you know, multi times over with that. Af- with a black affect. She just made. You see a black um, person doing it, then, you know, she just made, I think, over. Yeah. $50 Fifty million dollars from OnlyFans. Fifty million. Damn. Fifty million. Fifty million. Yeah, How much Tiger I made? I'm I'm never gonna hate on a girl right, who. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna hate on a woman who who and she to, to, to me still uh, you know a young a young girl c- growing into a, a woman, but I'm never gonna hate on these people taking advantage of you know their success to become all of this. But like I said, there are people who are doing the same thing in our space who get to just roll over in the bed, get on, put their camera on and make money to support their whole life and things like that, who are white, who are saying what we're saying, who literally watch us to grab our talking points and utilize it on their channels and go back to bed. I have to do this. Fight for our people. Say, say say stuff for people who look just like me and you or have the conversations where we agree to disagree. Get off of this. Hurry up and go get lunch so that I can cook it before I log in or log back in to my nine to five. Hmm. Well, all hearts and minds are clear. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. I mean, not moving well, on, but like sit in it. Like we got about two minutes left before we got about two minutes left. So people hour, who are but... watching the show right now, if you haven't follow us um, on and below is all of our Twitters. I need you guys to continue. I to don't follow, follow me on Twitter. Us. I ain't going to Twitter um, anymore. Y'all got that? Y'all keep that one. I have follow everywhere else though. Hours. Hours. You still, you know what I'm talking about? I, I mean, I don't know. Whatever publishes through Twitter is automatic at this point. I ain't giving Elon Musk no more of my data. Okay, Jeez. okay. No, I said I haven't yeah. seen you on Twitter in the last two hours. That's <laughs> oh, no, nah, I ain't going to be on. You ain't going to see me there no more. But, um, I'm good. But, yeah, just follow us on um, on Twitter. You guys can follow me on Instagram if you would like as well, at The Songstress. Right. Help us build our community. Help us build our platforms. Um, and so that, you know, because we're going to be doing extra stuff on, you know, on the side as well. And we want you guys to follow all of that and to continue to help us push forward so that we can again, be unchained and be able to do this for you guys every day. And, and, you know, know that we're just not a monolith even here. There are so many things that we can do um, to help us grow and to help us build and sustain ourselves so that we can continue to do this with you guys every single day. So follow the show if you haven't already. And if you got here, please like, share and subscribe. Even after we get off the air, share it with the family members, share it with the friend. Um, it. It's a vibe over here. Continue to help us push the platform. Love you guys. Mean it. We have reached the end of the show. I don't know 
know if you guys want to keep it live. I don't know if you want to take it to the after party. We got a few more things that we want to discuss, and we'll see you there after at, at the after party. I don't know what y'all want to do. What y'all want to do? We following your lead, Kevin. Going to the after party, I guess. That's where we going. Okay, yeah, we going to you the after party. We going. We going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we started. See you there. Hey, I'm listening to that. I'm listening to that later. Right, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Alright y'all, we thank y'all so much for tuning in today. We are going to the after party, so if you are not a Patreon member, you can hit today. Patreon.com slash like it or not. Patreon.com slash the BPD show. Make sure that you have your ass in the place on Friday. The patron party is going down. Karaoke edition. Not want to miss it. Be there, be square. Alright, your affirmation for today is I am doing my best. That's my affirmation for the day. I am doing my best. So damn with everybody. Yes, they have doing my best. I right, deal with it. I'm getting lost. All right, y'all. We love y'all. Mean it. We'll see y'all in the after party. If not the after party, we will see y'all tomorrow.